Now, now we hear from Melissa Miller uh, about uh, <coughs> submarines and the National Marvels and yeah. their associated geofencing problems. Yes, covert defense problems. Right, so thank um, everybody for coming. Great. Uh, let's get started. I'm, I'm, the work I will be telling you about has a bit of number theory in it, and when that started to happen, I needed to get some help. So some portion of this is joint work with Ken Kramer, a number theorist at Queens College, where I teach. Um, so let's go. Um, OK, so first of all, as you all know, David Hilbert had problems. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he came right here to Vienna in 1900 and, and detailed his problems very openly and honestly. Yes. <laughs> A and the the um, tenth of his problems was, um, as, as he stated it, to find a decision procedure for what we now call HTP of Z, um, a procedure which would take any Diophantine equation, so that's a polynomial equation, several variables, but integer coefficients, and determine whether or not it has a solution using integers. You know, classic. Even, even in 1900, it's a classic problem. It goes back to, well, Diophantus, at least. Um, and now, first of all, Hilbert doesn't appear to have considered the possibility that there was no algorithm for it. Uh, and in fact, this is 36 years before uh, Alan Turing gave what became the, the standard definition of an algorithm. So, um, so Hilbert just said, find a procedure. You know, we're, we're good Germans, we will find something somewhere. And in 1936, it, it became obvious that, well, first of all, there, there's a rigorous definition of what an algorithm is. Second of all, that some sets that you could enumerate were not actually decidable. And 34 years after that, it was finally proven that, um, in fact, there is no algorithm to do what Hilbert demanded, right? So um, in fact, uh, this set, Hilbert's 10th problem, so, so using the definition up here, polynomials over the integers, polynomial equations, which have a solution in integers. Um, in fact, that set is just as hard as the whole thing problem. Okay, it, it's one equivalent, and I will eventually remind you what that means, strong version of Turing equivalence to the whole thing problem. So yeah, so definitely it's undecidable. Um, now, you could ask the same problem for any ring you want, or at the very least, any ring where you can run, it can talk about algorithms, so say a countable ring, maybe where you have a presentation of it somehow. Um, and so Hilbert's tenth problem for an arbitrary ring R will be exactly the same thing here, only with R in place of the integers. So it's a set, first of all. The problem is to find an algorithm or prove that there is none for determining membership in the set. And um, even for the rational numbers, we don't know whether there's an algorithm hmm. at this point. That's a serious open question. Uh, having a very serious question. Okay, not so serious open question, yes. <laughs> Oh, um, so, I mean, if you, to start question. with, sure, no, this makes sense. I mean, two things that you could imagine it depending on. One is what degree polynomial are you looking at? And second, how many variables, right? right? I mean, both of those make sense. And they sort of play off against each other. I mean, you know, for things like linear functions, even in many, many variables, you certainly know the answer for, for you know, um, one before, variable. Before it's already passed. Huh? Uh, for one variable, you do already have an answer. Yeah, right. that, that's easy. As you go up, um, yeah, when you get to degree four, it's bad if you have a whole lot of variables. I forget exactly. Um, as the degrees go up, it's known that it's undecidable even for smaller numbers of variables. And so, so you know, there's a two-dimensional array here, you can sort of imagine. Um, not everything is known about it. Okay. There, there are some spots that where it's still open, definitely. Um, so yeah, so that, that, that very much matters. Um, I've promised to minimize the number theory here, largely because I can't handle too complicated number theory myself. So we're not going to get into any seriously challenging polynomials. 
But, um, but yeah, people work on this, definitely. So, okay. Um, before we get to Q, ju just, yeah. What do you mean, also? <laughs> okay, this is probably the first one. Uh, <laughs> Zwing Robinson has this beautiful result, which I never understood. So you can define Z being, being yes. within Q. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's just an easy result. It's not. But that doesn't have any relevance to this, does it? it will, so let me get through a couple of slides until I start talking about Q. Okay. And then, then, we'll, then we'll bring it in. And if I don't, remind me. But I, I expect it'll come up anyway. So OK. So yes, in a couple of slides, we'll start talking about Q. Just uh, warm up here. Let's talk about Z for a moment. Um, so Diophantine equations, you're looking at questions like this. Find, an integer, find integers satisfying that equation. Repetitions allowed. That one has a really easy solution. Uh, sorry, what is it? Wait, empty set? One, two, three. I mean, a solution should be a solution should be three integers, right? In this case, it's a symmetric polynomial. So yeah, one, one, three will do it, right? Uh, one cubed plus one cubed plus three cubed equals twenty-nine. You're allowing zeros. I am allowing zero, but but you don't need it. One cubed plus one cubed plus three cubed equals 29. That's actually not the only solution, I might point out. Um, 4, negative 3, negative 2. Check it. It works. Just to make the point, negative integers are allowed here, right? So you can't just say, oh, I, you know, when I, when I ask you about 30, you can't just check everything up to 4 and then say, oh, anything bigger would be no good. Negatives are allowed. And if you don't allow negatives, is it still undecidable? If you don't allow negatives, it's easy. So it's just easy. Right, I mean, you, you, <laughs> by the time you overflow, yeah. you say, OK, yeah, 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 OK, yes. <laughs> uh, right. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, well, if the polynomial has negative coefficients, then it could get a little more interesting. And is it more interesting? Well, yeah, you know, but um, if it were HP, HTP for the naturals, yes. then it, it's not very interesting. OK, um, 30? Anybody know? Um, I, I have to thank, <laughs> I have to thank Bjorn Poonin for, he, he didn't solve all of these, but he put together this sequence, which is very illustrative. This is the only known solution for 30. Um. Up to symmetry, of course. <laughs> um, that was discovered within the last 20 or 25, anyway, years. Um, Noam Elke's had some bright idea and said, if you do this, you could probably get a solution. And a team of researchers went and did that and found a solution. So um, this is kind of challenging, right? I mean, I mean, one of the points of this equation is to put the fear of God into you. So, um, uh, I don't know entirely, but mostly no. It, it wasn't just a computer going and searching by any means. As I say, Elkies had an idea from stuff in number theory that if, if you follow it and chase it down, it should work. Um, and it did. Um, oh, this is just a good place to start. Yeah. Um, they may all be. I don't know. But I, I mean, look, there's nothing really special about sums of three cubes either, right? I mean, it's a fairly simple situation where, where you can get a simple equation, but you can also get very complex <coughs> equations, or at least, you know, slightly complex equations, like 30. And um, 31. <laughs> yeah, now that you're <laughs> scared. Um, 31 has no solution. And there's really a pretty quick proof of that if you look in the right place. Um, the right place to look, or one right place, is mod 9 arithmetic, <laughs> of course. Um, in mod 9, the only cubes are 0 and plus and minus 1. You know, you can just check that, this 9 thing, if you cube them. Okay. And therefore, a sum of 3 cubes could be anything from negative 3 to 3 mod 9, but it couldn't be 4, it couldn't be 5, so 30, 31 as a sum here is just out. And also 32 is out, same reason. OK, 33, now it's negative 3 mod 9, so that doesn't work. 33 is an open problem. <laughs> 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 I 
I don't know about that. I mean, you have to ask the number theorists, but maybe somewhere computers are working on it. Somebody, I, I mean, again, the, it, just to make the point, Hilbert's tenth problem for Z here is a computably enumerable set, right? I mean, you, you can start a program running that just goes through polynomials on the one hand and tuples of integers on the other hand, and any time it finds a solution to a polynomial, it lists that polynomial, here's something that's in HTP of Z. So it, it's a computably enumerable set, proven to be undecidable, um, and therefore the complement is not computably enumerable. And one of the corollaries of, so I never did say it was, this was solved by Matiasevich, that's the M who finished off work by Davis Putnam and Robinson. For, Davis Putnam and Robinson in the 1960s basically showed that if you had a function with certain properties, then Hilbert's tenth problem would be undecidable. And in 1970, Matiasevich, in knowing their work, but independent of them, came up with such a function. Okay. And they're all wonderful about giving credit to each other. They're, they're very nice about this. It's heartwarming. Um, so, but a corollary of the, the undecidability of HTP of Z is that, well, assuming ZFC is consistent, or if you prefer, you can put PA in place of ZFC here, then there must be polynomials F, which have no solutions in the integers, but ZFC can't prove it. So there's an there are incompletenesses in ZFC even at this low level. You know, now, is 33 cubes here equaling 33? Is that one of those polynomials? I don't know. Can anyone write down such a thing? Well, so no, at least not in ZFC. No, but what, what you can well, approach the action to ZFC. Yeah, but so if you have a, pr if you, if ZFC <coughs> proves that there are no solutions in Z, then the second half has to be false. You are just going to mm -hmm. code con ZFC into the Alphantine problem. Can you fit it into it? Can you create it? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can code it into the halting problem. Yes. And from that, you can get it. Right, I just here. wanted, can we write it down? Or does it fit, you know? On a, on a single slide? I don't know. I doubt it. But, um, yeah. But, no, but the point is, I mean. They're universal. Well, I mean, I'm, we're assuming consistency of ZFC here. Of course. Um, you can write down a polynomial that. The well, let me give you the argument for this. Suppose that well, there. I'll leave the result. I just yeah, asked yeah. you whether you can impress us and write down. Okay. The yeah. But I mean, I, I, the argument is very quick. I was going to do it anyway. Suppose there are no such polynomials, then you could list out the complement of HTP of Z just by looking for proofs from ZFC that polynomials don't have solutions. You know, consistency would mean that when you get such a proof, it, it's true. You know that that polynomial has no solution. And if there are no f's as described here, then every f with no solution, you'll find a proof sooner or later that it has no solution. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but so that's saying that the, the things that happen in, the, in this list of five equations sort of all have to happen. Sure, there are, there are easy situations. There are polynomials that have solutions, but it's really hard. There are situations where you can prove that there's no solution. And I don't know if 33 is one of them, but there certainly are polynomials where you will where there's no solution, but from ZFC, or your favorite decidable system, you'll never be able to prove it. Okay. So yeah, so, so that's, that, that's how come this is a logic topic, right, in some sense. I mean, the fact that this is Hilbert's tenth problem strongly suggests that Hilbert thought of it as a number theory problem. You know, the logic problems were the early ones in his list. Um, but it sort of, well, it stayed the tenth, but it sort of moved up with the others over the years. Um, so, okay, so fun and games with HTP of Z, right? Um, let's get a little more serious here and talk about HTP of Q. So, let's see. Um, first of all, well, HTP of Q is also a computably enumerable set. And every computably enumerable set is one reducible to the halting problem and therefore one reducible to HTP of Z because of Matiasevich's proof with DTR. Um, 
But without assuming that, it's still pretty easy to see that you can, that if you knew h, g, t, and z, you could determine which polynomials have solutions in q. I mean, take a polynomial. You want to know whether it has a solution in q. Well, write it in terms of integers, right? You're looking for rational solutions, so just write the rationals as integers. Take a common denominator. Um, the second part of that, that z greater than 0 doesn't look like a polynomial, but um, if you remember the four squares theorem, you can sort of incorporate it into a polynomial. So the first part here just set is, so this polynomial is a sum of two squares, and we're dealing with rationals here. So a solution would be something that makes both of the two squares zero. The first square being zero says either z is zero or else this is zero. And putting the z to the degree of f here is just to clear out all the denominators from f, so you really do have a polynomial, right? Um, and then the second part being 0 says that z is equal to 1 plus the sum of four squares. This is, we're talking about integers now, right? We switched over to integer variables. So first of all, if z is 1 plus the sum of four squares, it's obviously positive. Second of all, every positive integer can be written this way by the four squares theorem. And so if this has a solution in z, well then the z variable is a positive integer and so that's not zero, so you must have had a rational solution to f. And conversely, any rational solution to f would give you a solution to this thing. That's a one reduction, right? It's a strong kind of Turing reduction. You started with a polynomial, you know, you started with a polynomial, the sort of thing that you want to know if it's in H, G, T, or Q or not. And from it, you computed another polynomial, which may or may not be an HDP of z, but it is if and only if the first one was an HDP of q. Okay, that's what a one reduction is by definition. It's a computable map from you know, the candidates for this set to the candidates for this set. Okay, that, that respects membership this way. Okay. Okay, questions, anything as we go, by all means. I mean, I don't have to tell you guys to ask questions, one right? One this is normal one here. One one. Uh, ah, okay, yeah. So, so if you look at that, um, just because of having the F here, I think you'll see it's a one-to-one -one map. Yes, one reducibility does mean it has to be a one-to-one -one function. Check. Um, and just while we're looking at this, a, a useful fact you can get out of it, um, that the property of being positive is definable by, a, by an existential formula in every subring of Q. And in fact, the same formula works for every subring. The formula just says, well, y, basically it says y is a quotient of one positive thing by another. Um, if y is in fact a positive rational, then there are integers that make this true, right? It's a quotient of positive integers. And so in every subring of Q, you will have a solution then, because you know, every subring contains the integers. And on the other hand, if there is a solution to this using any rational numbers at all, and therefore anything from R, then certainly Y has to be positive. Um, so, okay, so that, you know, that's very clear, that's elementary, but it's good to know that you can define this property of being positive everywhere. And so you're starting to see a few of the tricks that people use dealing with Hilbert's 10th problem. Okay, now where I wanted to go here is not just Q, but its subrings. Okay, so let's talk about those. First of all, how do I describe a subring of Q? I tell you which primes have inverses. And that's exactly the information you need. There, there's a bijection between subsets of the set of primes and subrings of Q. And the bijection is just take your set of primes and take the ring where you invert all of those primes and nothing else, right? So, so, um, so you're, you're getting a, just a ring like z of you know, 1 half, 1 fifth, 1 thirteenth, whatever else, corresponding to the set that contains 2, 5, 13. And if you're doing them in this order, presumably does not contain 3 or 7 or 11, right? So, so a set of primes corresponds to a subring of the rationals, okay? 
Um, all right, great. Uh, there will be times, just point out, that I'll be talking about a subset of omega instead of a subset of prime, so bear with me. You know, you can go back and forth between those very effectively. No problem. Um, those who remember computable structures, if you're wondering which subrings of Q have computable presentations, the answer is precisely those where the set W is computably enumerable. Doesn't have to be computable. Right, if you can just enumerate the primes, then you know you, you don't have to give the, the the reciprocals here in order or anything. You just have to say what they are going out. So an enumeration of W is good enough. And conversely, from a computable presentation, you can certainly search for the primes that have inverses. Okay, so yeah, and very last extremely niggling point: um, HTP of R W in theory is supposed to be a set of polynomials with coefficients in RW. <coughs> RW is a subring of Q, and if you have any polynomial with rational coefficients, just clear out the denominators. Right? Make it an integer polynomial. So just to keep things simple, I, when I say HTP of RW, I'm really just going to be thinking of a set of integer polynomials. Right? The question is still, do they have solutions in RW? But if the polynomial was, 2 17ths x squared minus 4 9 y squared or something. Just multiply by 9 times 17 and make it an integer coefficient. Okay, cool. Um, all right. This was the title of a. I have an answer. Mm -hmm. so yes. When we have two subrings, yes. yes. you could look at the GS outgen problem for the larger ring using coefficients from the smaller ring. You can. But again, if the coefficients are in the smaller ring, then they are certainly rational. And so just, yeah, yeah. So the rest of this talk, essentially, I'm going to stay inside of Q. There are people who go well beyond Q. I mean, Hilbert's tenth problem for algebraic extensions and things like this. Um, so far, I'm not one of those people. So you're, you're welcome to stay away from that yourself, too. <laughs> um, yeah. OK, yeah. Um, pseudo jump operators. Yeah, so as I started to say, I, I made this the title of a talk once, and it wasn't a good idea. Everybody got scared. <laughs> um, so, okay, a pseudo jump operator. It's not a big deal. Um, it's an operator that works kind of like the jump. Duh, right? Um, okay, so, so the jump operator, you remember, just for any set A, the jump of A, written A prime, is the whole thing problem relative to A computable functions. So you treat A as an oracle and say, if I have access to A, first of all, what functions are partial computable? And then once you have that list, you can say, OK, which of them actually halt on which input? That's the halting problem relative to A. That's A prime. OK. Um, so, uh, so what is, so, so these other operators, um, well, they, they work basically the same way as the jump operator, um, given an input set, the output set, f of a, um, first of all, should actually compute a itself, just like the jump does. a prime always computes a. And second of all, um, the, the output should be computably enumerable relative to a by some uniform process. Isn't a pseudo jump operator? Yes, is a pseudo jump operator. Um, kind of a boring one, but you know, uh, hey, yes, absolutely. It's like a pseudo uh, you know, yeah. Well, I mean, the main the main point is the uniform computable enumerability, right? That if you're given the set A as an oracle, you should be able to enumerate the set F of A. Okay, I'm bringing this up, of course, because it, I want to think of Hilbert's tenth problem as an operator this way. So the HTP operator takes, well, takes a set A, I said it should be a subset of omega, right? Translates it into a set of primes, the obvious way, and then enumerates the set of integer polynomials that have solutions in the subring where those primes are inverted. And if you know the set W, if you have an oracle for the set W, you, you can enumerate that set of polynomials just by searching for solutions in the ring um, Z of W inverse. I will be writing this ring RW just to make it less of a mouthful from here on. 
but yeah. So that, and um, very quick question, of course, wait a second, there's one other condition. Does HTP of a set, call it say HTP of W, actually compute W? Um, yes, it does. Basic facts here, that, that's number two on the list. Um, so let's, let's go there first. Um, w actually one reduces to HTP of our W because if you got a prime, you want to know whether it's in W. Just ask whether the polynomial px minus one has a solution in RW. That's easy. On the other hand, upper bound HTP of RW is computably enumerable relative to W. So it's certainly no harder, in fact, it's one reducible again, to the jump of W. Right, so it's W prime, always. And uh, I, I, I mean, yeah, so, so certainly it is a pseudo, HTP is a pseudo jump operator. Okay. HTP of Q is the simplest HTP set out there. Now remember, Hilbert's test problem for Q, that's the thing I said at the beginning, we don't know if it's decidable or not. It could be just as hard as the halting problem, as far as anybody knows. It could be computable, decidable. It could, in theory, be anything in between, although that would be amazing. <laughs> I mean, we don't know any sort of naturally defined sets that are strictly between computable and the halting problem. Naturally defined computably enumerable sets that are strictly between zero and the halting problem. So nothing has ruled this out as yet, but it would be a mind-blowing result if it turned out to be the first. Um, I mean, there are plenty of such sets that have been sort of built by computability theorists in the laboratory. You know, you write a program that does what you want and that creates sets in between and comparables, you know, all kinds of CE sets. There's a very rich structure there, but they, they've never yet been cited in the wild. You know, I, I mean, we're, we're just very good at creating them ourselves. So, um, okay, but in any case, let's get back to this. Um, HTTP of Q is at the bottom of all of these sets. And again, there's a fairly simple reason. You can just run through it. I mean, a polynomial has a rational solution if and only if this thing over here has an integer solution. That's exactly the same as we wrote before, basically, which is true in turn if and only if, well, okay, each of these implies the next and the last is the first again. So eventually, if and only if this same situation, thinking of the z greater than zero as a polynomial now, um, has a solution in your favorite ring here, RW, right? If it has an integer solution, then it certainly has a solution here. And if this thing has a solution here, well, that means there were, there were y's and z in RW that made this true. The z was positive, so f of these quotients must equal zero. And a quotient of things in RW is just a quotient of rational, so it's certainly a rational solution. So in the end, that implies that f was in HTP of q again. Okay, so all of these conditions are equivalent. And in particular, f has a solution in q if and only if this polynomial here, using the script with the sum of two squares, um, has a solution in RW. Okay, so HTP of RW is never any, is always as hard or harder than HTP of Q. Okay, um, so we said already HTP of RW is always one reducible to W prime. It can equal W, it can be one equivalent to W prime. Um, that's the result by Matthias Evich, Davis, Putnam, Robinson, right, for the integers. So the integers are what you get when W is the empty set, and the jump of the empty set is the halting problem, and that's Turing equivalent to HTP of the integers. Okay, so it can get that, that, that well, good or bad, depends on your point of view. Um, it doesn't have to, though. So the next, you know, next question, does this always happen? Well, no, take a set W, which is computably enumerable and non-low. Okay, so non-low means that the jump of W is strictly higher than the halting problem. Low means that the jump of W is just the halting problem itself up to Turing equivalent. Okay, so if W is computably enumerable but non-low, you can still search for solutions in RW, right? You can list out the elements of RW because you can list out the primes that have to be inverted 
And then you can search for solutions to whatever polynomial you want. So HTP of RW is a computably enumerable set. And therefore, it is, at worst, as hard as the halting problem. But on the other hand, W prime, if W is not low, W prime is strictly harder than the halting problem. So HTP of RW doesn't have to be as hard as W prime. And as a matter of fact, if you went whole hog and took W to be the halting problem itself, which you could do, sure, um, then it works the other way. Then HTP of RW is only as hard as W itself. Right? So you've got the whole spectrum here, at least in certain cases. Yeah, OK, so there's some work to be done. OK, um, first question, how about Turing reducibility? Does the HTP operator preserve Turing reductions? The jump does, first point, right? If, if A is Turing reducible to B, then A prime, the jump, is always Turing reducible to B prime. It's actually not an if and only if, but it does work in that one direction, right? The jump operator respects Turing reducibility. HTP, different sort of operator. Hmm. Okay, well, um, gut reaction, yeah. I mean, if, if I take something like Hilbert's tense problem where I invert the primes that are in the complement of the halting problem, well, the complement of the halting problem is exactly as hard as the halting problem, um, HTP of R sub zero prime has degree zero prime, we just saw. So if if HTP preserves Turing reducibility, then this would have to be true. This ring here, which is basically a very difficult co-CE subring of Q, would have to have a Hilbert's tenth problem that was only that hard. Well, it could be the case, but uh, it seems a little unlikely. Um, and so we do prove here that HTP does not preserve Turing reducibility meaning it's kind of different from the jump, which is of some interest. Okay, how do you do that? Well, so taking the lead from this initial thought here, the idea is to build a, a complement of a CE set, so a co-CE set V whose HTP is bigger than zero prime. And how do you make something bigger than zero prime? Well, easiest way, make it compute zero double prime. Right. If that works, that'll certainly be good enough. Um, zero double prime, okay, equivalently make it compute the set fin, folks remember that, the set of indices of finite CE sets. That's a very natural index set that's Turing equivalent to zero double prime. In fact, one of the three to zero double prime. Okay, um, so what that means then is that I, I want to come up with a ring and some, some group of polynomials where if we is finite, then, the, then in some listing that I have, the eth polynomial um, should, let's see, if we is finite, then the eth polynomial should have a solution in the ring. And if we is infinite, then there should be no solution in the ring. I want to build a ring where that happens. And I want to build that ring by starting with all the primes inverted, starting with v equals omega, and then removing primes from that list. I want it to be a co-CE set V. Okay. So there is some number theory here. Nothing hard, promise. Um, so here's a polynomial. Uh, again, it, it's a little more intimidating than it real. it looks a little more intimidating than it really is. You've seen by now how to write x greater than zero and y greater than zero as polynomials. So you can fill in that part, I hope. Um, what this polynomial really says is that x squared plus y squared should equal one, right? If this equals zero, then all of the three squares will be zero. So x squared plus y squared will equal one. And the point of the last two terms is simply to rule out the trivial solutions, you know, x equals zero and y equals plus and minus one, or the other way around. I don't want those. Okay, so x greater than zero, express that as a polynomial. Remember, using the four squares theorem, you, you can set, there's this polynomial that has a solution if x is bigger than zero and not if it doesn't. Right, so plug that in and then take its square because I want this thing to be a sum of three squares 
so that if this equals zero, all three of the things are zero. I mean, taking a sum of squares is a way of taking a conjunction of, of different statements, right? So, okay, so, so what this is saying then is, yeah, x and y should be numbers, the sum of their squares should equal one, but it's no fair setting one of them to be zero, and the other plus or minus one. Okay, that's, that's cheating, that's too easy. So, okay, there are still plenty of solutions because, of course, a, so a solution in rational numbers now corresponds to a pair of rationals satisfying that. Take a common denominator, multiply through by it, it's a Pythagorean triple, right? Three-fifths and four-fifths is the solution to this. Square both of them, add them up, you get one, fine. Um, right, five-thirteenths and twelve-thirteenths. You can look for a bunch of solutions. I, I mean, I, you know your Pythagorean triples. Um, Useful fact about them, though? Anybody ever notice this? Um, whenever you find a Pythagorean triple, and you, so the C over here, which I think of as the denominator, all the prime factors of C are congruent to 1 mod 4. I mean, just start generating Pythagorean triples if you want. You know, I mean, you can get them with 5, with 13, with 17. Um, can't get any with 11 offhand is the C, right? And something squared plus something squared equals 11 squared. Uh -uh. Um, so that, that is, in fact, a fact. <sighs> yes, OK. Um, so uh, I mean, very quick proof. First of all, if C, if C were even, OK, obviously, if everything were even, we would just cancel out a 2. So, uh, so A and B are not both even. Therefore, in fact, they're both odd. But then mod 4, a squared and b squared are both equal to 1, whereas c is even, so c squared mod 4 is 0, and so that didn't work. Right? So 2 can't possibly divide c. And similar argument, um, so if you have an odd prime that divides c, well then modulo that prime, a squared equals negative b squared. Again, the p can't divide both of these because there's no common factor. So, in fact, it divides neither of them, so you can put the b squared down here using the fact that this is a field, and find that negative 1 is a square mod p, and that does mean, in fact, that p has to be congruent to 1 mod 4. That's early, I don't expect you to remember it, I don't offhand, but that is early on number theory. So, okay. <coughs> so that's the only place that you can find solutions to this inverting primes congruent to 1 mod 4. But good news, take any prime at all congruent to 1 mod 4, um, there's a very old theorem, theorem, I think Euler finally proved it, that goes back as far as Fermat, I think, that says every prime congruent to 1 mod 4 is a sum of two squares of integers. And with that, well, here's a solution, 2x squared plus y squared equals 1. Okay, just work it out, solve it all. So, okay. So, if you invert any prime congruent to 1 mod 4 in your ring, then you've got a solution to this polynomial. Okay. If you don't invert any of those primes, then there's no solution. Again, given you see why we wanted to rule out the two trivial solutions, the four trivial solutions. You know, I mean, if they're around, that, that blows everything out. But, okay, um, so this is a useful polynomial this way because I can build a ring how do I build a ring? Well, I start telling you which primes have inverses and which ones don't. And I can sort of keep you on tender hooks here, right? Does f have a solution in, in this ring? Well, um, so, and remember what I want to do with that. I want to in encode the answer to a question about whether a certain CE set is finite, whether E is in fin, where E is the index of a CE set. So I start enumerating the set, and every time the set gets a new element, I take the next prime congruent to 1 mod 4 out of my set V. Right? V is supposed to be co-CE, so it starts containing all the primes, and you take them out as you go, the opposite of a CE set. Um, if WE has infinitely many elements, then all the primes congruent to 1 mod 4 are out at the end of the day, and there is no solution to this polynomial. But on the other hand, if there were only finitely many elements in E, then, in fact, almost all of the primes congruent to 1 mod 4 stayed in the ring. 
right? So this is the sort of polynomial that lets a devious computability theorist code information into the ring H, T, P, and V. Um, that's practically a tautology, right? Devious computability theorist. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, great, just one problem. That's only one bit of information. Right? I mean, okay, great, I've got this polynomial, but I, I can only code one fact about Finn using it. I mean, I, I obviously can't get more than that. So we need something better. And this is where I had to go find a number theorist, right? So um, I, I did come up with, starting with the lemma here, I did come up with these related polynomials, x squared plus qy squared minus one, where q itself is an odd prime number. Um, and once again, you know, modify it to make sure that x is not zero, so you don't have any trivial solutions, any integer solutions. Um, and the same sort of argument as before, will prove for you, you know, just if, if P is a prime factor of the denominator of a solution, mod out by P and you will see that negative Q is a square mod P. Okay, which is decidable, right? I mean, Q is a fixed prime here. For any P, you can certainly decide if negative Q is a square mod P. Ken Kramer at Queens College added what I needed the for, the, for, the, for the backwards direction, essentially which is that for any such prime, any prime p where negative q is a square mod p, just inverting p will give you a non-trivial solution to that polynomial. Okay. So it's the same deal as with the first polynomial, except now we've got a whole set of these. And you know, a nice computable set, you know, these polynomials can be listed out very easily. Um, just language here. Um, this negative Q is a square mod P. You remember the Legendre symbol and stuff like this here. Um, so we will call such primes P Q appropriate. You know, the ones which, give, which if you invert them, will give you a solution to the polynomial F Q. Okay. Well, we are devious, but we're also merciful. I'm not going to drag you through all the details of how you build a co-CE set V from these that actually encodes the set fin. Um, I mean, th there are a few obvious complications, right? When you put, when you take a prime out of V, okay, you take it out because it's Q appropriate for some Q where you want to get rid of it, but it's appropriate for a whole lot of other primes too. And so, in fact, the bad situation is where you want to keep one Q appropriate prime in the set V, but it's, you know, it, so it's, it's five appropriate, but it's also 29 appropriate and 47 appropriate, and the, the, with E equals 29 or E equals 47, some other requirements are saying, you gotta get that thing out of here, it's ruining my power. <laughs> um, so, okay, this is where people like me come into the game and figure out how to play with this and, and do a priority construction, um, which as I say, I will refrain from describing here, but um, you can in fact get it so that at the end of the day, um, the polynomial F sub QE, that's just the eth odd prime, nothing more. Um, F sub QE has a solution in the ring that we co-enumerate, the ring RV, if and only if E was in fin. Okay, so HTP of RV computes fin, right? And in, in fact, if you believe that this, this is a one reduction, it takes a little more work, but okay, if you believe that this is a one reduction from E to FQE, then you have a one reduction from zero double prime to HTP of RV. And on the other hand, the, the point of doing all of this, V is the complement of a CE set, so V complement here is CE, and that means that its HTP is pretty easy. Right, it's only as hard as zero prime, okay? And zero prime is strictly easier than HTP of RV. Now, well, V and V prime are complementing each other, so they're certainly Turing equivalent, but when you take the HTPs of those two sets, they're way off. <laughs> I mean, they're off by a jump, which is as bad as possible, okay? So, yeah, I mean, so the, the Let's see, at least in one direction, let's see, V was Turing reducible to V bar. No, other way around. V bar was Turing reducible to V, 
but HTP of RV. V is the co-CE set. V was Turing reducible to V bar, but HTP of RV was not Turing reducible to HTP of RV bar. Right, okay. Um, so so th these are quick little facts that one uses here which allow the priority argument to work. Essentially, you have to say that you did something right except for finitely many primes. And then there's a nice little fact about semi-local rings. Um, and this does go back as far as Julia Robinson. I still want to talk about that, but um, yeah, coming soon. Um, but right here, the, the, the fact is just that you can sort of get around finitely many primes in this way by adjusting your polynomial. So in the end, it's not just that f sub q sub e. It's something a little more complicated, but it sort of f, f sub q sub e and some other stuff to make the, the finitely many primes problem go away. Okay, um, skipping over that. So one more thing I'm not going to tell you about, high permitting. Permitting is this strategy that computability theorists use to build one set computably in another. Um, high permitting works when the second set is known to be a high set, a, a set, a CE set whose jump is all the way up to zero double prime, which is the highest that a jump of a CE set can be. Um, and without going through the details, what we can do with this is to get two subrings of Q. And so if you think of both of them as subsets of Q, then R is strictly easier to decide than S. But when you take their HTPs, it turns around. HTP of S is strictly easier than HTP of R. Right? So the HTP operator does not just fail to preserve Turing reductions, it totally disses Turing reductions, right? I mean, it, it takes these two things and just flop. Okay. Um, and as I say, I'm not going to go through the details, but it's good to understand sort of how this happens. Um, the very basic strategy, you, you, so you want S to be relatively difficult to compute. S should not jump up very much further than S. It has to be at least as hard as S, but it shouldn't go further. Um, and to do that, well, make S be a computably enumerable set, right? And fairly close to zero prime, because then its HTP can only go up as far as zero prime itself. HTP of a CE subring is also a CE. Okay. So that, that holds down HTP of S, and on the other hand, you can take the R to be a bit below S, but still fairly far up, still of high degree, and co-CE, right? A co-CE set can be turning reducible to a CE set, no problem there. Um, and you do what we did with it so that its HTP is all the way up to zero double prime, right? So that's how you can keep the HTP of S down and make the HTP of R leapfrog over it up to zero double. Um, right. And yes, I mean, it's very nice to see the high permitting happen here. I'd love to tell you about it, but I'm going to refrain. So, okay. Oh, question. Yeah. Um, okay, that's a good question. If you delete finitely many primes, the degree stays the same. Okay, and in fact, that goes back to that, this fact right here about the semi-local rings. Um, uh, okay, um, I, sa I said that a little bit too much. If you delete finitely many primes, the degree stays the same or goes down. Okay, we don't know if it can ever go down or not. Therefore, if you add finitely many primes, it may go up. That's, um, it is known that it, yeah, if you take some away and put some different ones in, then that, then things start to get hairy. Um, yeah, I mean, there may well be a theorem there. We don't have a counterexample to the fact that it just always stays the same for finite differences. Yeah, well, that understood. Um, so, um, we do, so I think that this goes back to Julia Robinson too. If you have a finitely generated subring of Q, so only finitely many primes are inverted, then its HTP is just as hard as zero prime. So just as hard as if you didn't invert anything. Okay. 
but it's, it doesn't seem to be clear whether that works in general when you start with just any old subring of Q and add finitely many more primes. Okay. Um, what this is saying is the opposite. It's saying if you start with Q and then knock out finitely many, you know, say, okay, I'm not inverting one half and one seventh, and, and you take away everything that they generate and so on, um, then uh, the degree stays the same. But if what you started with was just some random ring and you take out finitely many things, it might go down. Mm -hmm. Well, I, okay. Now, one thing I would remind you here, um, the, the, sets, um, th the sets that we're dealing with don't have to be CE or co-CE, right? I if you start with a set of primes that's incredibly complicated, its HDP is at least as complicated as that. So the range does go way the heck up. Um, and we will, there is a theorem coming up about that. It will turn out that you can get an HTP in every degree above zero prime, zero prime and above. Um, whether you can get anything in a degree outside that depends on whether HTP of Q computes zero prime. Was there one other question there? I thought I saw a hand at some point. Maybe it was just a stretch. Okay. Um, okay. So, so again, uh -huh. an HTP above zero prime is the degree of an HTP. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something very hard. Something like. <laughs> well, but again, um, well, yeah, okay, well, well, never mind. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. So, quick little, as I say, tweak here. Um, you actually can get one reducibility here. Um, again, I'm not sure that will thrill too many people here. Um, so, so let's not spend too much time with that. But um, yeah, you can refine this construction so that in fact the, the HTP here, HTP of RW is one equivalent to the jump, W prime. Okay, and okay, so this says there is a pi zero one set where you can do that. Um, it doesn't mix in with a high permitting. And that's not surprising, actually. So that, that has to be that way. Okay. Um, okay, so lots of details here. And fine. Um, now, HTP completeness. So whatever else may happen, HTP of RW is definitely CE in W. W prime, the jump of W, is the master set among all sets C, E, and W, right? All of them are one reducible to W prime. So for W to be complete for the HTP operator, very naturally should mean that every set that C, E, and W reduces to HTP of R, W, and reduction to HTP of R, W. Okay, in the same way that just for, I mean, when, when people say the halting problem is one complete, sometimes they just say complete, but okay. One complete means that every sigma one set, every CE set, has a one reduction to the halting problem, which is, you know, very quick from the definition of the halting problem, in fact. It's sort of, it, it's built to be complete this way. Um, so this is exactly the same concept, only relative to A, this is saying that, you know, HTP completeness is saying that HTP of RW is as hard as possible. And you don't actually have to worry about every set C, E, and W because you've got this master set, the halting problem. If it one reduces to HTP of RW, then so does everything else. Okay. So yeah, so HTP completeness is difficulty for HTP. Right. Um, and one point here, um, people will often ask whether a set is diophantine in RW. Okay, diophantine means defined by a diophantine equation. And to be a little more specific, defined by an existential condition um, using, um, so, so th the set A here is defined by saying that, you know, N is in A if and only if when you plug N in, in a polynomial, you get a solution, you, you get a polynomial with a solution in 
the ring RW. So this is being defined in RW by a Diophantine condition, an existential condition with a polynomial. Um, if that happens, then A1 reduces to HCP of RW, right? Because, I mean, the one, remember what a one reduction is, right? It's, it says you've got to have a computable function which takes any n, any natural number, and outputs, in this case, a polynomial, because polynomials are the things in HCP of RW, outputs a polynomial, which is in HCP of RW if and only if n is in A. So the computable function is given n output f of n y. Right? That, that's, so that's diophantineness. That implies one reducibility. And um, we don't know whether the converse is true. Right? If you have one reducibility, do you necessarily have a diophantine definition? In the case of the integers, in the case of w is the empty set, the answer is yes. Okay, but in general, not known. Um, number theorists haven't really asked that because they've never heard of one reducibility. You know, and so I'm asking it, but I don't have any answers. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean that's true too, but I'm not going to say it. Um, he said oxymoronically, yes. Okay, something like that. Um, okay, uh, but theorem using the exact same uh, processes that we did before, so so there's not much new right here. For every set C, there is an HTP set of that Turing degree. Okay, so there are, it makes it seem like there are a lot of HTP complete sets out there. All right, um, and it, yeah, in fact, infinitely many. No surprise there. Um, and so, so essentially, that's the same proof as before. You you, you say, okay, given C, I can produce a W which in some sense comes up by a pi 0, 1 process relative to C and whose jump encodes um, the jump of C and in, and in such a way as to give yourself a one reduction. All right, um, but what that gives you then is what I promised you a moment ago. Um, so every degree above zero prime is in fact the, is the degree of the jump of some set Okay, so whatever the set was, call that C, there is an HTP complete set, Turing equivalent to that C, and so when you take HTP of that thing, it, it's certainly then Turing equivalent to the original degree. Okay, so you do hit all the degrees above zero prime. And bearing in mind that HTP of Q itself is the smallest HTP set, the smallest thing in the range, if you hit any degrees at all outside of zero prime, then HTP of Q has to be strictly below zero prime. So that's a hard question, right? I mean, I mean people have been working on HTP of Q for 40 years now, and uh, that's not answered. So, okay. Um, yeah, now. Mr. Bell, yeah. every mm -hmm. degree between zero prime and zero double prime, is the jump mm -hmm. of something below zero prime? Uh, let's see. See, certainly every sigma two degree yeah. is the jump of something down there, um, oh. right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, sometimes. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, Sachs was the one who inverted the jump at that. You know, in that way, right? From set C E and zero prime down so to you don't know the range of this operator on the degree scale zero prime. Huh? Oh, it, it, if you take a degree below zero prime, where does it go? I mean it, it can go to zero double, it can go to zero prime. Because you don't know what it's in between it's not clear exactly what you would um wait, no. It's not all uh, uh, in between, yeah, everything between zero and zero prime is hit somehow, but not necessarily from a delta two set. Yeah. Not necessarily from something below zero prime, as yeah. far as I can tell. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So it looks like there are a lot of HTP complete sets out there, right? They're, they're in every degree. Um, hang on. Different way to go about this. So 
there's, there's this property called being relatively CE. Okay, so a set V is relatively CE if there's some other set that can't compute it. And in fact, so, so the U has to be strictly below V in the numerate V. Right? So if you were really doing this right, you might say relatively properly CE, you know, properly CE relative to something below it. Okay. Anyway, no, that's a mouthful. So okay, relatively CE. Um, so back in 1980 and 81, Karl Jokosch showed that co-meager many sets V are relative. And then his student, Stuart Kurtz, in his thesis showed that measure one many sets are relatively CE. So most of them have this property. Okay, you know, those are the two most obvious senses of most. Okay, so problem. No, none of these sets, these co-meager many, measure one many sets, is HTP complete. Okay, and there, there's a very quick proof of that. I mean, th this one, um, so let's see. Um, suppose you have a relatively CE set, and again, that, that means you're talking about almost all of them here, almost all sets. HTP of that set, so, so if U is the thing below V, like this, well, U can enumerate V, so once again, it can also enumerate the ring RV, and therefore it can enumerate the set of polynomials with solutions in RV. So HTP of RV is CE relative to U, and that means that one reduces to U prime. That prime there is just barely visible, but HTP of RV, one reduces to U prime, right? On the other hand, just, just mind you here of the so-called jump theorem. Um, so, which way is it? V, uh, uh, yeah, what I want is that the jump theorem, this is you know chapter three of SOAR way back, um, says that Turing reduction, V Turing reducible to U, um, holds if and only if one reducibility holds on the jumps. Okay, I mentioned earlier on that the jump operator preserves Turing reducibility. If you put a T here, then the backwards direction is false. Okay, but if you make this one reducibility, then it's an if and only if. Okay, and our situation over there is that, okay, U is strictly below V, meaning V is not Turing reducible to U, so V prime is not one reducible to U prime. <coughs> On the other hand, HTP of RV is one reducible to U prime, and so V prime had better not be one reducible to HTP of RV. I mean, if it were, you'd have a contradiction. Okay, so that's a really quick proof. Yeah, and it says therefore that the HTP complete sets are, uh, um, let's see, yeah, the HTP complete sets are rare, right? They're meager and have measure zero because no relatively CE set is HTP complete. Okay, interesting thing because remember for W equals the empty set, the case with the integers, um, that's HTP complete. Right, the jump of the empty set is the halting problem, and that's one reducible to HTP of Z. That's the Matiasevich result. So um, apparently the integers are weird that way. Huh. Okay. Now, well. Of course, anything above zero prime is relative to HTP. No. HTP, the jump term, the jump term. Uh, mm, okay, so. Oh, the set has to be the jump. You're, you're, Turing degrees, uh, yes, but the set itself has to be the has to be C E and something. And, and not every set above zero prime is a jump. Right. Um, so everything has the same degree or something like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Does something like this theorem hold if you're replace the jump operator by the HTP operator as one reduced ability? Uh, let's see, so it would be V, uh, let's make it positive, right? V is diophantine in U if and only if HTP of RV, one reduces to HTP of RU. 
that, that's what you're asking, right? I think I should write it down. Um, both sides, or, yeah. Right um, hmm, yeah. Um, asking whether, if you, so if you've got HTP of V and HTP of U over here, asking whether this is diophantine in this ring, in the, the ring where you inverted the, that, that seems a little weird to me. I, I would think you'd want a one reduction there. Over here, maybe, V diophantine in U would, di diophantine in U really means diophantine in the ring R U, right? Um, uh, let's see, well, okay, wait. So if V is diophantine in R U, then V has a one reduction to, a, I'm, I said HTP of U, I've been writing up there, HTP of R U, doesn't matter, whatever. Um, so if this is true, then V itself has a one reduction to this. So in a, certainly in a fair number of cases, this will not one reduce to this because this will be strictly harder than V itself in one reducibility. Um, how many cases? Good question. That we don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's certainly not an if and only if in any case. So, okay, so you know, all these things are good to think about. You but yeah. the jump operator. You want, you want to Ah, uh, yeah, okay. What is the HTP of HTP? Of HTP. HTP is the set of polynomials. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you have the girdle numbers of the polynomials, and then you take the primes corresponding to those particular girdle numbers and invert those primes. The fishy bit is the girdle number. How do you make a polynomial? I thought the whole thing was pretty fishy, actually. <laughs> Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, iterating things is natural. In this case, it's not as natural as sometimes. But uh, you know, I don't have an answer. Maybe it goes somewhere. Don't see it offhand. But yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. There, there were some situations, right? When we said that when you take zero prime itself to begin with and take its HTP. Mm -hmm. That's still a CE set. It's still it's still one equivalent to zero prime, and so there it would just sort of stay in that one degree forever. It would never shoot off. So you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, so the the bottom here is just reminding you about meager, right? Nowhere dense. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people remember that. Maybe not everybody, but um, right. So this is bare category. It, it's sort of an alternative to measure, but. Um, you know, any, anyway, whichever you prefer. I mean, you know, HTP complete sets are very rare, no matter whether you're a bare category person or a LeBage person. Um, okay, so, but this points us to what's really going on, because there is a fairly fundamental difference between the HTP operator and the jump operator. And it appeared when we talked about inverting, uh, about how R could be let Turing below S, but HTP of S was less than HTP of R, how you could reverse Turing reducibility. And it's appeared again here. Um, the HTP operator is something more than just a pseudo jump operator. Okay? Um, so if I want, so again, pseudo jump operators, uh, I, I, this was on a previous slide, but let's just write it down. So a set A mapped to f of a, which was uniformly CE in a, right? There's some Turing functional which can take an a oracle and enumerate this set. Um, that's a pseudo jump operator. Uh, it had the one additional property that this thing should compute a. Okay, fine. Um, for the HTP operator, you don't actually have to have an oracle for a. All you need is an enumeration of A in order to enumerate HTP of RA. I've been using W. You only need an enumeration of W to enumerate HTP of RW. Right? And, that, and according to the definition here, that's exactly what an enumeration operator does. It, it takes, sorry, what? Um, oh, so, so, a Turing program only that has an oracle. Oh, 
you know, that has instructions that say, you know, in certain circumstances, look at the oracle and see if the current cell there. So, yeah. So it's just saying using, um, yeah, in this case, using the C as an oracle. What is C? Well, an enumeration of A. So a, a set which you want to think of as a set of pairs of naturals, although of course it could be just a subset of omega, um, which projects onto A. Right, so, so being in A is an existential condition over C that way. Um, and so an enumeration operator, well, anytime you give it, not A itself exactly, but just anything that enumerates A, and that, you know, that can wait 5,000 years before even starting, right? Or 5,000 levels in, in the diagram before even starting. Um, <coughs> no matter what enumeration of A you give it, it's supposed to output an enumeration of G of A. Call the G over here, not F. Okay. Um, and yeah, with the, the, the HTTP operator is exactly that sort of thing, right? You, know, you, you enumerate for me the primes in W. I can enumerate the ring R sub W, and using that I can enumerate the polynomials that have solutions in that ring. These things are more natural than you might think. Anybody know a very standard enumeration operator in logic? You know, I think we talked about this once, so I talked about this with either you or Luca this week, so don't answer. Um, um, standard enumeration operator. Well, you can enumerate the truth. Yeah. Given a set A, you can enumerate the consequences of A, and you don't actually need to know what's in A and what's out. You only need an enumeration of A to enumerate the consequences of A, right? That's an enumeration operator. Um, just to be clear, one thing I dropped here was that requirement that A should be Turing reducible to G of A. If you had that, certain the, the um, consequences operator would be messed up because if A is, is contradictory, if A is undecidable but inconsistent, then, op, then you know, the consequences of A is everything and that's very decidable. So, okay, so, so, I let, so we let that go from this definition, therefore this is not, strictly speaking, a strengthening of the notion of pseudo-drop operator. But the main point is the HTTP operator, like the operator mapping an axiom set A to its consequences, is an enumeration operator. It only needs an enumeration of its input. And <coughs> that's what we used when showing that the Turing, um, when showing that HTTP can disrespect Turing reducibility. Right, I mean the big set, the, the, this is your point of view, the big set F was CE. And that means, okay, it's CE. In terms of enumeration type means it's incredibly simple. You can enumerate the thing, effectively. So its HTTP was not very big. Whereas the, the set that was smaller in Turing reducibility was a good deal more complicated in, as an enumeration thing because it was not computably enumerable. It was a complement. So its HTTP got bigger or its HTTP was able to get bigger the way we built it. <coughs> okay, and that's also exactly what was going on, I'm going to go backwards here, um, right here. Um, the fact that you know, the smaller set U could enumerate the bigger set V meant that HTTP of RV, you really only need U for it, right? V is not as, as tough as it looks, it, it's CE in something smaller, and that tends to hold down its HTTP. Right, so it couldn't go all the way up. It couldn't go so far up as to be one equivalent to V prime. Okay, so, so that feels like what's going on here. And all right, so, so well, first point, how about the jump? I mean, if the jump were also an enumeration operator, then what's the big deal? Well, the jump is not an enumeration operator. And just to make that clear, here's a very simple, Turing functional, right? So what, what we're saying here is let E be the index, or you know, the co program code for a function which on oracle A, and given X from the natural numbers, totally ignores X, and just look through its oracle to determine whether the number 17 is in A or not. Okay, if 17 is not in A, then the program halts and outputs zero, which is irrelevant. Um, 
If 17 is in A, the program goes into some sort of loop or something and never holds. Simple program to write. Okay. Um, I'm using 17 just because it's one of the most random numbers around. Okay. So, um, okay. So, <coughs> so if you're looking at the jump of A, the jump of A asks whether this program number, e, you know, E is in A prime if and only if um, this program halts on the input E. Well, the input is irrelevant, so just if and only if this halts on whatever input you give it. And that happens if and only if 17 is not in A. Now suppose somebody gives you an enumeration of A and 17 is not in A, you'll never know that for sure. An enumeration doesn't tell you that. It only gives you positive information about A. Right? Um, so from an enumeration of A, you'll never be able to say for sure that E lies in A prime. If you see that E is, if you see that 17 is in A, then you can say, oh, well, then E must not be in A prime, but that doesn't really help. You're supposed to enumerate A prime. Um, so, yeah, so if your operator somehow made a lucky guess with this A and said, oh, yeah, I think E is in A prime, I'm going to enumerate E into A prime, well, then the enumeration of A didn't have 17 in it. And so there are a whole lot of other sets which begin with that exact same enumeration, but don't have, but do have 17 in them. And on those other sets, the 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 you know whatever was trying to succeed here would also have said, oh, you know, E must be in B prime, but it's not. So, um, yeah. So the jump operator is not an enumeration operator. The jump operator really needs its A oracle in order to enumerate A prime. Okay. So that's a principal difference between the jump operator and the HTTP operator. Now, what does that buy you? Well, I mean, I'd love to come here and tell you, oh, that means HTTP of Q must be, you know, incomplete or non-computable or something. I don't have anything like that yet, unfortunately. Um, what we can ask, though, um, so certainly if you have an enumeration operator, E, E of B does not always compute the jump of B for the same reason that HTTP of B of RV does not always compute B prime. You could just take B to B, it, to, um, uh, right? If, um, if you take B to be A prime here, then yeah, E of A prime is no harder than A prime itself. Um, but it is possible, in fact pretty easy it turns out, to give an enumeration operator where the, so the, the E of A here is just A joined with the halting problem. Given an oracle for A, on the one hand, enumerate A, which is incredible. I'm sorry, given an enumeration of A, on the one hand, use it to enumerate A, which is incredibly easy, and on the other hand, enumerate the halting problem, which you can do without any oracle at all in many things. Um, and so if this is your E of A, it is true that A prime Turing reduces to this E of A on a set of measure one. Not everywhere, right? There's a set of measure zero on which this fails, which has, you know, continuum many elements. But, um, but on a set of measure one, this is possible. What we can say is that that Turing reduction there and any other like it cannot be done uniformly, cannot be done by a single Turing functional. Okay, so if you have an enumeration operator and just one Turing functional and you're thinking, well, maybe this Turing functional with this enumeration operator is enough to compute the jump, to compute the characteristic function of the jump here. Um, well, maybe in a lot of cases it is. It can get arbitrarily close to measure one, but it cannot do that on a set of measure one. Okay. Um, and so in particular, take E to be HTTP here. Um, so if you give me HTTP of our W, there's no single method that computes W prime from that, even on a set of, well, certainly there's no single method that computes W prime from HTTP of W all the time. We know that already. But even just up to a set of measure zero, there's no way to get it by one single method. Okay. I mean, characteristically, what will happen 
is there might be one method that computes for any epsilon, there will be a, me a method of computing it up to a set of measure less than epsilon. But it will always be a set of positive measure on which it fails. I'm sorry, say. Um, same thing happens. Yes, I, I've left that out here, but yeah. Um, haven't quite thought about it that way. I'd have to stop and do so. But um, yeah. Um, okay. Um, so here I'm actually going to use bear category all of a sudden because bear category is where we can prove this theorem. Um, why should you care about whether HTP of RW computes W prime, which, which is the bottom condition here? Um, or more generally, fix, take a fixed set C, it might be the halting problem, but something else too. Um, why should you care whether HTP of RW usually computes C? And the answer is, well, in the case of bare category, we can tie that together to the decidability of HTP of Q itself. If HTP of RW computes C on a non-meager set of subrings, then actually HTP of Q must also compute C. And assuming C is not itself decidable, that would be an amazing result. So the hope here is that maybe, okay, HTP of Q has been really challenging, but we can get away from it and just say just on a not too small set of subrings, you could compute you know, the whole thing problem or at least something non-computable. Um, and as I say, if C itself is zero prime, then for all of these things to compute C is equivalent to saying that they all compute W prime. Um, there's a co-meager set on which, um, uh, on which W prime is equivalent to W join zero prime. Right? There's a co-meager set of sets that are called generalized low one, if anybody remembers this. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to go through this. This was done a little bit earlier. Um, I, I was able to make it work using bare category. We don't yet have a proof for whether this holds when you use measure. Right? I mean, you'd like to say, do this with measure and instead of non-meager, say set of positive measure here and likewise there. Um, so to, to talk about, to make that work, we would have to look at the boundary sets, and I haven't used that term yet. Um, in some talks, this is where I would finish with an appeal to all the number theorists in the audience that, you know, here's what I want to know about polynomials. Um, I don't know, is, is that actually, I don't know everybody here. Is, uh, is that a non-trivial set at this point? Or anybody here call themselves a number theorist? Not a lot, okay, or at least nobody's willing to admit it. Okay, um, well, so, so just to give you a quick idea, um, boundary set in a topological sense. Let's see, I think I have, yeah, so, so um, remember the, the, the polynomial f sub q that we had, x squared plus qy squared minus one, and getting rid of the trivial solution with x equals zero. Um, so in terms of measure, I want to think about the rings that we were interested in were rings where there wasn't any solution to this in the ring, but the ring never lost hope, right? I mean, it was always possible that there should be a solution. So, I mean, you know, some polynomials you do lose hope. A very simple example here. If the polynomial is, you know, 5x squared minus 1, and I tell you that 5 is not inverted in this ring, then forget it. Right, so um, that you know that that loses hope legitimately. You can prove it, and HTP of Q in general can tell you when a polynomial loses hope. It's not clear if this is decidable or not, but with an HTP of Q oracle and using that fact from Julia Robinson earlier, you can tell um, when when a polynomial has no prayer anymore. You know, given that certain primes are not inverted, you can just say the polynomial has no chance of having a solution. Um, this polynomial here always has a chance, right? Because there were infinitely many Q-appropriate primes. 
And so no matter how many of them you've said, no, that one's not in the ring, that one's not inverted, that one's not inverted, there's still hope. <coughs> um, and that's exactly what we used to code this privileged information. Back then it was information about the set fin in. You know, the fact that the, well, I, I mean, different, in, you can use this different ways in different contexts. You could either sort of say, okay, I haven't put one of those primes into the set yet, into W yet, but I still could, no matter how far I've gone, I always still could. Or the way we used it, we said, okay, keep taking out the Kiwi appropriate primes, and then eventually, if you want, you know, if, if something halts or whatever, um, you put one in. You leave one in. Okay, so this can be used differently in different contexts, but this is what lets you sort of code undecidability into a subring. Um, so these so-called boundary rings, the, the rings in this boundary set for the polynomial, um, seem like a key this way. The one thing about this polynomial, the boundary set has measure zero, right? I mean, what are the odds that you never ever invert a Q appropriate prime? Well, there are infinitely many Q appropriate primes. And you know, it's 50-50 whether you invert each of them, so the odds are zero, okay? So the boundary set is non-empty, but has measure zero. Big question, is there a polynomial whose boundary set has positive measure? Mm -hmm. And again, if, if, you, if you, you know any friendly number theorists and you can explain this to them, by all means put me in touch with them. Um, right, so is there a polynomial where the boundary set has positive measure? Um, if not, then we can get the analog of that last theorem for measure as well. And if so, then a lot of other interesting stuff would follow from that. Um, among other things, I'm finally going to get to talk for a moment about definability of Z and Q. Yeah, you've been waiting, I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> but, um, okay, so very, very quick background. Julia Robinson was the first to prove that there is a formula that defines the set of integers as a unary relation on the field Q. It's by no means obvious, right? You want a, a formula with one free variable. If you plug in an integer, the formula is true. Plug in anything else, the formula should be false. Try to think of something. I mean, you know, it's hard. Um, uh, so as I say, Julia Robinson did this. Her definition was pi four in complexity, right? It's the x such that for every y there is a z, such that for every t there is a u, such that some formula in x, y, z, t, and u holds. Um, <coughs> well, okay, that's pretty complex, I guess. You don't think so. Um, but uh, Bjorn Poonen, about 15 years ago now, got it down to a pi two definition. And then within the last five years, Jochen Koenigsmann at Oxford gave a pi one definition. I believe it has, the f at least his first version, had 418 universal quantifiers at the front. <laughs> but it's pi one. <laughs> I mean, look, from my point of view, you can condense those all into a single universal quantifier using a, a 418 tuple, sort of. But ask him. I mean, they're, they're, those are number theorists. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. But, um, well, it's kind of, it means that the complement of Z is diophantine in Q, right? There's a polynomial which has, a so with one free variable, and then you know a bunch of other variables that, that are still. So if you plug in a non-integer for the one free variable, there's a solution in Q to this thing. But if you plug in an integer, there isn't. What we really like is the other way around. An existential definition of Z in Q um, would mean that basically you could code HTP of Z into HTP of Q. You want to know if something has a solution in Z well, I'll write a polynomial which says there's a solution in Q and each thing in the solution then satisfies the definition of Z in Q. So for model theory, this is a, ser I mean, these are very basic structures. Is there an existential definition of Z in Q? The general guess is no. Um, 
Uh, Barry Mazur has a conjecture which, if it's true, would imply that there is no existential definition. Okay, this is telling me that I have a train to catch in an hour, so <laughs> we're going to have to wrap this up. But, um, but yeah, the, the general de suspicion is no, but there's no proof. And um, theorem here, if Z does have an existential definition, then these boundary sets here definitely can have positive measure. And in fact, if you take the union of the boundary sets for all the different rings, its measure is one. Okay, so you should care about these things. Right? I mean, this this matters somehow. Um, the, you know, an existential definition of Z and Q would be terrific, and knowing that there isn't one would be very very nice as well. Um, if it turned out to be, um, well, let's see, a negative answer here would show that there is no existential definition. A right? positive answer wouldn't necessarily show that there is one. Um, it would certainly get you somewhere, so it would be very nice. But, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and with that, I do need, uh, so let me apologize quickly. I would love to stick around and talk to anybody who's interested in this. Um, I'm on my way to Siberia. I have a flight tomorrow morning from Prague. I have to catch a train tonight to get there, so. <laughs> what, 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 what was your crime? Uh, computability. <laughs> so, okay, so I'm going to stop it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>
I, I think they, they've gotten situations where it is decidable. I don't know about finite extensions, but there are some, I want to say number fields. Of the algebraic closure, of the algebraic closure, I, I think. <coughs> don't quote me, but there are some things where I think they can do that. The more common result is to try to code HTTP of Z into HTTP of the field and thus show that it's undecidable. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much.